Uh, thank you, Paige, and thank you, Kristen. And I also wish to extend my thanks to uh, several people, uh, Martina Tanga um, in particular, um, for her inspiration behind this uh, marvelous course. I'm really delighted that the MFA is you know, so deeply invested in these community histories that are important to contextualizing our lives today in Boston. Um, I'm also delighted to be in a series with um, not only Martina, but Michelle Miller Fisher and Lynn Cooney, and I look forward to their lectures in subsequent weeks. I, uh, as, as Paige noted, uh, these exhibitions are very much collaborative in, in nature, and um, the, the first one, Christian Walker, The Profane and the Poignant, so much of this research has been uh, conducted in partnership with my collaborator, Noam Parnes, who was at the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art in New York, which is the LGBTQ Art Museum. Um, and is now at the Whitney. And uh, the, other, the other exhibition, um, As the World Burns, Queer Photography and Nightlife in Boston, Boston which is uh, very much the focus of my lecture today, uh, was, was uh, done in partnership with Laurel V. McLaughlin. And it's really just been a tremendous joy to work with her as well as with Dina Deitch and the entire curatorial team at Tufts University art galleries. So I just wanted to acknowledge um, their uh, important contributions to these projects. So this is a topic that I've been thinking about for a few years in some depth. I must say that it, it came to me in a kind of organic fashion in um, in a early COVID-19. I was writing a lot of uh, essays about the relationship between HIV, AIDS, COVID-19, and queer historical memory. I was really fascinated by the ways in which people were talking about um, uh, uh, COVID-19 in relation to HIV, AIDS. I thought that um, people were making these, especially the media, were making these sweeping statements about how this was like this. Um, and uh, for me, as an expert on global histories of HIV AIDS and visual culture, I wanted greater nuance. So I started writing um, different essays on targeted themes, um, thinking about how the various cultural archives of HIV AIDS related to what we were all um, going through at the time. So these ranged in subjects from um, public sex um, to um, the Catholic Church to museums and mourning. But I began to feel a bit like a one-trick pony, and I wanted to think in great depth about how um, the cultural archives of gay liberation might be of relevance as we think about how um, queer communities might reconstitute themselves in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, for a very long time, I've been deeply influenced and moved by the work of Nan Golden, as well as many other people in her general circle in Boston um, in the early 70s. And I found myself returning to this work. I became obsessed with um, how, um, became obsessed with the, the idea of how coming out had something to do with going out and going outside and being in public and photographing and being photographed. Uh, this was something that you know we weren't able to do in quite the same way um, as dance parties migrated to Zoom during COVID-19 and as someone who's deeply invested in community histories of, of queer culture, um, these sorts of issues were on my mind. I also um, am deeply knowledgeable about um, the history of gay liberation in Boston and um, was, have always been struck by the ways in which, especially Nan Golden's work, is totally severed from a political and social context in terms of how it's debated um, within histories of art and photography. Um, so on the right, for example, we see um, a publicity photo from Gay Community News. This was actually um, the newspaper of record in the United States and actually arguably on a global scale in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. And yet the way in which her work is talked about is um, outside of that context of gay liberation. So I wanted to think more about you know, why are 
politics so separate from the ways in which we think about her early practice, um, knowing that um, frequently, you know, there are these histories of the so-called Boston School of Photography, which is something we'll be talking about in this lecture um, that revolve around a fabled group of friends um, who mainly went to the School of the Museum of Fine Arts or the Museum School across the street, as well as the Massachusetts College Museum, uh, Mass, Mass Art. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it's a very small number of people who are included in these histories, and we'll explore that in, in a little bit of depth today. Um, but I, I wanted to expand the, the, my knowledge of uh, these histories um, to contextualize, at first, Golden's practice. So here we see um, an image of Sylvia Sidney, Boston's most notorious drag queen, um, giving um, uh, some sort of prize or something to Marlene, who's um, a, a trans woman. Um, who perform regularly at the other side. Um, and here we see the other side after it had closed in the mid-1992, I believe, a picture that uh, Shelburne Thurber, who was Nan Golden's closest friend um, uh, in the 70s, or one of them, um, she took after Nan Golden asked her to um, return to the site, which had closed in 1976, and photograph it. Shelburne Thurber was one of the only uh, or arguably one of the the only artists uh, who was part of this so-called Boston School who was still living in Boston. Uh, and this photograph is actually the last image in Nan Golden's 1992 book, The Other Side, which presented a lot of this early work um, that she made of um, her pilot photographic undertakings at the other side, which is a notorious drag bar in Bay Village. And on the right, that's how it looked um, in 2021, when it's actually just right across from Jack's Cabaret, which still exists, and some of you might be familiar with it. But this essay, which turned, uh, called uh, Against Our Vanishing, Cruising the Queer Archives of a Disappeared Boston, um, has had, I think, somewhat of an influence, um, at least I like to think so, in, in local um, arts discourse and it has, um, you know, inspired this exhibition as well as, you know, um, I've, I've been really delighted by how people have been responding to it. Um, I collaborated on a dance party, for example, at the ICA with the Nightlife Collective Boudoir. Um, which then on Thursday actually we'll have another collaboration at Man Ray inspired by these histories. I'm really um, compelled to bring them to life and um, to, you know, again, find ways to contextualize um, our lives uh, in relation to this amazing archive. And what we're seeing on the screen right now is um, an insert that was included in gay community news called the Gay Crusader, and it just gives a sense of the richness of the textures of um, this this public that was emerging, you know, just a few years after uh, Stonewall in Boston. So if you think about it, you know, we just have a few, hardly that um, gay bar is still in existence today, but back in 1974, um, there was this amazing. Um, selection of different, um, you know, queer uh, or lesbian and gay um, bars and restaurants and bathhouses and cinemas and um, places where you could buy fetish gear. Um, if you look closely, you can see a range of different offerings. So this exhibition, um, which again is kind of um, the rough focus of this talk is trying to bring together um, not just you know new stories, introducing new characters, people who've been left out of uh, histories of the so-called Boston School. Um, and in a Boston School, uh, it was this kind of ironic term that Nan Golden coined in the mid-90s on the occasion of um, an exhibition, a, a groundbreaking landmark exhibition that Leah Gangitano and Milena Kalinowska curated at the Institute of Contemporary Art. Um, and it was called Boston School. 
Um, it was kind of alluding to an earlier moment within Boston's art history from the early 20th century, um, but specifically referring to the photographic practices that had been um, arising, photographic practices in which a broad range of uh, practitioners were using their experiences of nightlife and sex as raw material for their art. So uh, this is, um, you know, just a small, um, you know, two two artists who I think fall into this category of so-called fine art. So contexts in which the, um, these practitioners were involved in teaching um, contexts or as or exhibition context of fine art. So Shelburne Thurber and Jason Byron Gavon are two examples. One of my specific contributions to this reframing is widening um, the, the circle uh, in terms of the educational institutions that are represented. So what I'm keen to do is to um, add, for example, the New England School of Photography or MIT or Boston University or Harvard, um, as well as artists who were trained at community centers um, and other sites in Boston. The second category that I'm exploring is the gay press. Uh, this was absolutely a crucial site for um, the development and consolidation of LGBTQ uh, identities during such a period of um, exhilaration, but also uh, tumult uh, from the 70s to the 80s. Um, and the gay press provided a number of crucial opportunities for photographers um, of various sorts. And I think in, in certain ways, um, the ways in which uh, these sorts of images circulated were a lot more influential um, than, for example, seeing an image on um, a gallery wall of a white cube gallery. Uh, these images uh, often, because Boston was a center, arguably the place in the world with the most radical and active profile and gay liberation in the 70s and 80s. A lot of people, if you were, you know, there are countless stories of someone encountering an image like the ones that you see on the screen right now, <clears throat> like Craig Bailey and Angela Russo, um, seeing it in a publication in um, as a as a person living in Kansas City, and then, you know being inspired to move to Boston because of what you see in a newspaper, a magazine. This isn't uncommon by any means. Uh, and the third uh, category that I'm uh, considering within this exhibition, uh, another um, important site for thinking about histories of nightlife and sex within the visual field is the community archive. And in particular, I uh, am thrilled to be foregrounding uh, two specific archives that or collections that come from the History Project, which is New England's LGBTQ archive. Um, and thinking about not just, um, you know, people who considered themselves photographers. So, um, you know, people uh, who were just taking images of things that they loved and people that were in their lives. Um, whether it was a nightlife space such as Playland that you see on the left or um, someone uh, such as Pat Gazemba, whose image of Fran's Place, a lesbian bar in uh, Lynn, Massachusetts, on the right, um, that um, was very much uh, an effort to document um, working class lesbians as part of the foundation of the History Project Archive. So the inspiration behind this exhibition is actually Christian Walker, which is an entangled exhibition. And it is literally um, his work, his theater project uh, series actually connects the two exhibitions um, when you see them in person, at least at this presentation at the SMFA. And Walker is a fascinating character for several reasons. Uh, firstly, he's... Um, a black gay man. Uh, a lot of practitioners um, who were part of art school communities uh, were white. He was actually one of the only 
um, black people on campus at the museum school in the early 1980s. Uh, so this is really crucial, even though there are tons, literally tons of lesbians and gay and bisexual photographers and artists at the museum school at the time, there was such a, a scarcity of people of color. Um, and um, so part of my interest in resuscitating him is to interrogate you know, the whiteness of a lot of these histories. Uh, he is notable though because he uh, was involved in the world of gay liberation uh, but also um, the world of the gay publishing or the gay press. Uh, and then um, in the 1980s, after he moved to Atlanta, he was avidly engaged in archives of vernacular imagery, especially uh, images that uh, were coming from his family life um, or had been passed down to him that he'd inherited. And so these three different categories seem to cut across his own practice and also seem to, um, you know, have various or, or make possible various types of representations of nightlife and sex. And so it seemed to me that um, developing an exhibition that uh, explored in greater depth um, the, uh, the context in which he was living in Boston from 1974 to 1984 made a lot of sense and it would um, be a, a useful sort of platform for restaging these histories um, through a more contemporary angle. Um, I'm, I don't have the opportunity to uh, go into the fullness of Walker's practice right now, but he was born in 1953 in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, and in 1974 he moved to Boston. Initially he was um, he was, uh, you know, working several different types of jobs, um, but got into photography and um, by um, he worked at um, or trained at, at the Cambridge Co-op um, Photo Co-op, and then um, the Boston Photographic Research Resource Center, and then in the early '80s was um, at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, one of his earliest um, projects or projects um, in the early 80s was um, revolving around the Fort Hill Faggots Collective, which was in um, located in, in Fort Hill in Roxbury, um, not far from here. And uh, it had, um, it was a really uh, key hotbed of, of rethinking uh, versions of gay domesticity at the time. So um, a lot of people who are highly involved in gay, libera gay liberation in Boston um, lived there, um, gay men in particular. And so Walker photographed a lot of couples who are living in the space um, in these really beautiful portraits. Uh, he was involved, as I said, in the gay press. This is actually his earliest publication, co-written with two other black community members. Um, and he's actually signing his name, Norman, Walk Norman Walker. He, he changed his name in the late 70s to Christian Walker. And it's a letter that's talking about uh, racism and racialization within the gay white community. It's addressed to um, GWM and GWF, which stands for gay white males and gay white uh, females. And um, if you look closely, you can see we left the comfort of our communities to explore um, our homosexuality. We were met with prejudice and discrimination within the gay white social structure. Uh, although we weren't loved in the black community, we were not hated for our blackness. So uh, it's notable that this is you know, the mid 70s and it's actually um, the same moment in which the Combahee River Collective, which is a black feminist socialist uh, lesbian organization uh, was writing um, their, their, their famous statement which kind of uh, paved the way for contemporary understandings of intersectionality. 
Uh, and so Walker is actually touching on something quite similar, co-written with Stefania Bird and um, Baha Brown. Stefania Bird was a lesbian poet and um, published the first chapbook of black lesbian poetry that, or at least some scholars have claimed that in Boston as well. Some of Walker's earliest pictures uh, were of uh, the combat zone in the bright light of day. The combat zone, as many of you probably know, if you're familiar with Boston's history, was where all the sex industries were congregating um, in uh, beginning in the 60s. So um, in, um, in the 60s, uh, that was when City Hall was being built and government center and formerly Scully Square was where um, all of these industries were concentrated for the most part, but then um, they had to relocate uh, more downtown to um, a very small uh, area called the Combat Zone. And um, there were um, you know, a, a, a large number of dilapidated theaters, originally from the 1910s, 1920s, they were um, sites where um, vaudeville performances took place and then they became um, movie theaters and places where uh, there was stripping and, um, and Walker um, was fascinated by this visual culture um, for many reasons. And th this is just you know, a small selection of this, this work from his, his days um, roaming around the city. Uh, his his first and most important project uh, from his Boston or it wasn't his first his first title series is called the Theater Project, and I am um, it, I I so he actually developed it um, as a student of Bonnie uh, Donahue and Bill Burke, who are both professors at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts still to this day. Uh, he was one of their students. He also studied with Jim Dow. And um, this is a, a close study um, of, of the Pilgrim Theater, which was a place where there was a lot of cruising. A lot of men uh, who had sex with men, as well as trans feminine women, went there. It was in the combat zone, where, again, a lot of queer people uh, flocked for work, but also pleasure. And um, uh, so you get the sense of this uh, pilgrimage, an impressionistic kind of auto-ethnographic pilgrimage um, in which um, you, you make your way through all the different spaces of this extraordinary dilapidated building, which had, um, you know, formerly had, you know, it, it, was, it was an architectural wonder back in the 1910s, but um, now the, the ceilings were covered in peeling paint and um, just the stench of it, a lot of people have described to me quite vividly. Uh, so it takes you through the foyers, through the um, lodges, um, the balconies, um, and the seats where, again, uh, people are loitering in search of various forms of sex and intimacy and uh, sustenance. Walker spent a lot of time here. Um, it was one of his favorite sites to, um, you know, go after the bars, which wasn't unusual. Um, and I actually have a quotation from him. Uh, so he turned this into a photo book in 1985. He writes, although these films, he's talking about the porn films, mainly straight porn films that were played, are readily accessible for private use in Super 8 and video formats, and as single pinup pictures and magazines on calendars, playing cards and towels, their full essence is most revealed in the darkness on the, on the large screen. They light the clandestine world that exists in the balconies, the lobbies, stairwells, and urinals of the old burlesque houses in Boston's combat zone. By this light, the profane and the poignant coexist. And this is the final uh, picture of the series. It uh, shows two black men, um, their lips locked. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous image in one of the basement bathroom stalls. 
and Walker writes, uh, describing the final part of the sequence, um, the urinals are below ground level beneath the city, little tombs, a steep stairwell leads down to a damp windowless lobby where I sometimes drank, smoked, and slept, and sometimes found myself engaged in odd catalytic romances, half believing that I could be transformed by a kiss from a stranger. So this depiction of public sex is uh, truly remarkable. Um, the fact that Walker was making work about public queer sexuality in this particular way um, at this time um, and doing so in you know, a very um, you know, moving, evocative, uh, aesthetic language is, is so important. And this uh, series actually had a lot of um, influence on the local uh, visual culture and politics um, somehow, or actually, so part, part of it was published in Fagrag, which was one of these gay liberation journals I was telling you about, um, where a lot of ideas of what we think of now as queer theory germinated. Um, Charlie Shively, who was kind of the ringleader, ringleader of gay liberation in Boston, wrote a poem, and uh, there was a spread with some of Walker's pictures from the theater project in the summer of 1983. That's what you see on the right, or sorry, on the left. Um, and then a copy of this journal got into the hands of the Boston Licensing Commissioner. Uh, yes, and so uh, she, you know, even though apparently she'd already known what had been going on in um, the Pilgrim Theater and the State Theater, which had a very similar profile, um, she used it as evidence of so-called kinky gaze and um, closed the theater down for a short period of time. So this was in just for a few days, but it kind of led to, um, uh, you know, a, a little by little, it became something that was policed um, increasingly. And um, it was also the kind of the, the last hurrah of the combat zone um, in this period as, um, you know, a lot of things were, were changing in the city of Boston. This was on the eve of HIV AIDS, um, in which you know queer cultures were radically transformed, especially public sexual public sexual ones. Um, there was a lot of um, urban renewal efforts, and um, the advent of VHS really changed how people were accessing pornography at the time. Um, the combat zone also was. Um, made smaller by the expansion of Tufts University New England Medical Center. So these are just a few different phenomenon, but that interlocked and, you know, you can hardly see a trace of what the combat zone is today, um, though some of the architecture still exists, and I can show you um, a glimpse of that. Um, it's this very small area that's uh, it's very close to where the Chinatown um, stop is on the orange line. And uh, it extends toward Lower Washington Street. It was really just two blocks long, but it was a, a zone that was set up by the city in order to um, concentrate the sex industries where all the bars and bath, uh, uh, there weren't bathhouses there actually, but where all the bars and, and strip theaters and porn theaters were um, uh, concentrated together. This is how the, um, the series looks uh, in our exhibition at Tufts. And uh, the vinyl wallpaper behind is a reference to uh, the second page, which is a translucent page of the theater project book that Walker published in 1985, which um, is a collage of different advertisements uh, for porn and porn theaters uh, from this moment, the late 70s or early 80s. <clears throat> so where to begin? <laughs> I, uh, as I already explained a bit, um, the significance of the Boston School of Photography and wanting to reframe this um, history. And um, one way that I approached this is through thinking about um, uh, 
excuse me, um, the other side, which was this drag bar that we've already seen, um, but through the different um, ways in which other practitioners were approaching it, not just Nan Golden. Um, and actually to think of Golden as not just you know, the photographer herself, but also um, a subject for other people. Um, Nan Golden, I probably, I don't think she needs much of an introduction if you're all here today and um, you know, evidently interested in the topic, but she's one of the most influential and powerful um, photographers in the contemporary art world today. Um, and so um, one of my personal projects is trying to decenter her within um, a larger community of artists and activists. And so the other side is actually um, a really um, uh, excellent opportunity to do that because it was um, a place where a lot of people uh, went for um, for community. Um, and Bobby Busnatch is one figure who um, you see on the left. This is um, a portrait as well as a self-portrait. He made it in collaboration with his best friend, Geraldine Visco. And he was a sex worker who was 15 or 16 years old in this picture. He had survived um, being institutionalized in an abusive family um, and uh, was hustling on Commonwealth Avenue uh, when he found the other side. And uh, it was this site where all these misfits, all the drag queens and trans women and scare queens and wannabes and hustlers and Johns and lesbians and um, you know anyone who didn't see themselves um, represented in a mainstream cultural sense um, where they spent time. Um, and it was also a disco. And so um, you'll see on the right picture of uh, some of his earliest work. Uh, he actually um, didn't print any of his work, uh, despite he, he took photographs. He actually stole a camera from a, um, a house that he'd been robbing purportedly in uh, 1970, at the early 1970s. Um, and that's when he started taking photos, but he uh, didn't touch them for um, something like 40 years until he returned to Boston after having been in New York for a few decades um, in the early or in the late 20 two, in the late 2000s and uh, went as a mature student to mass art. Uh, this is uh, work by Alan Frame. I don't know why it's formatted funny here, but. Um, uh, a, a unique photograph of him and uh, his best friend, Geraldine, who's kind of, I describe her in a recent essay as a fag hag for the history books. Um, um, she um, was also an artist and, um, um, you know, a club kid who um, had quite a following in New York. Um, they both became um, really key figures within the queer uh, glam rock uh, and disco scenes in New York in the mid 70s right after they left Boston and uh, sadly they both died actually um, within the past few years in a way uh, it was a the genesis of this particular project because Bobby um, Busnatch founded the Facebook group for the other side which um, as, as some of you might know Facebook is actually a really beautiful outlet for people um, who belonged to different nightlife communities, you know, of yesteryear to reconnect. And he was the one who um, managed this, this Facebook group, which became a Facebook page um, beginning in 2012 or 2013. Um, and it became a community archive project for him. And, um, but it, he was also a very inconsistent and anarchic, um, archivist, uh, uh, re stealing a lot of photographs from other people <laughs> and um, creating these um, convoluted videos from those images put to disco tracks that he, as, as a DJ, had created. Um, so it was a very chaotic sort of site that I encourage you to check out. For me, it's been a crucial research 
Tool and Bobby died in 2019, I'd actually just tried to get in touch with him on Facebook. Um, and uh, he was living in Provincetown. I was supposed to visit him, but alas, um, he had a heart attack. One of the most treasurable works in this community archive is a video called As the World Burns by Mark Weiner. And he is, um, was a film student at BU and made this film that centers on themes of queer friendships and it stars Bobby and um, one of his friends, B, who's also uh, one of Nan Golden's most famous models, someone you've probably encountered uh, quite a lot if you have seen pictures of her work. And um, it, you know, starts off as a kind of ordinary uh, walk along the esplanade and then ends up as this uh, or orgy in which all the clothes stay on in uh, the apartment in Beacon Hill where Lee, who's B's sister, lives. And these are just some videos, but uh, some, some screenshots from the videos, but they give a sense of, um, I think, the, the thickness of the, and the strangeness of, of a lot of these friendships that emerged. And um, even though the other side as a space isn't depicted literally, uh, it is the place where Mark Weiner, who was coming in, actually driving in from Newton um, late at night to go to the bar a couple of times a week, was where he met these uh, this cast of characters and uh, created this film that was loosely inspired by Bobby's life as a hustler and all of his delightfully messy friendships. B, um, as a muse, uh, figures into this exhibition in so many different capacities. Um, and I'm interested in the ways in which she co-created her image with the photographers and artists. Um, and this work by Avram Finkelstein uh, is a case in point of that. It's actually based on part of a Nan Golden photograph. Um, uh, at some point in the early 70s, uh, Golden gave uh, a photograph, a, a Xerox copy of a photograph she'd taken of B. Uh, her her arm in a contorted position to Avram, and it's actually a work that I've never seen because it's not a very common photograph. And um, he uh, had actually studied ceramics at the museum school. He wasn't a photographer, but, but a lot of his work was inspired by photographs. And he had a job, um, he was given a job placement. There was a placement office back in the early 70s in which museum school alums could be set up for work opportunities. And he got one at the Women's Educational um, and Industrial um, uh, Organization, I'm forgetting the, the full name. Union, Union thank you. <laughs> um, and he was purportedly the first um, man to work there, even though he himself that at the time often wore women's shoes and um, uh, dressed in drag, um, and, and it was a lot more um, variant in terms of his gender identity. And so he learned how to needlepoint at this union and um, made a work that was um, supposed to be a representation of B's entire likeness, but it turned out that he could only um, devote himself to part of her fingertip. <laughs> and, and so um, I'm interested in how photography um, was uh, an influence on artists working across different media, such as Avram Finkelstein. And this is um, a slide that brings together th um, three different types of artistic practices, photography, video, and um, needlepoint. And all of them are involving um, B as this um, gorgeous model and muse. Uh, Finkelstein also uh, revisited this project um, after, you know, he, I don't know if you um, are familiar with histories of AIDS activism, but Finkelstein became um, 
one of the founding members of the Silence Equals Death Collective living in New York in the late 80s, and then um, that became Grand Fury, which is kind of the art wing of, of ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. So his trajectory uh, in art and life became a lot more political, but lately he's been returning to the art world in really meaningful ways. And um, uh, this was a commission that you see on the right from The Shed, uh, and it's loosely based on um, this work on the left from 1972, uh, and it is a digital manipulation of uh, representations of hands, um, bees hand, and by a photo, uh, based on a photograph by Golden, as well as David Armstrong's, another photographer in their milieu, and then finally um, his own hand replicating this pose. And it's a jacquard weaving, so it's, that's a technology that goes back to the early 19th century and in a lot of ways previews um, uh, computer programming. It, it gave way to uh, more sophisticated um, mechanical models that, um, you know, in, a, in one way or another lead to the technological developments that we have today. So this work is very much thinking about these legacies of friendship and community, um, but also shifting technological and social and political notions of uh, gender and language. And this is how it looks installed in the exhibition. Another uh, example of um, Finkelstein's practice and the ways in which it was dialoguing with photography uh, is this work uh, on the left, which is a portrait, an entitled Portrait of Kenny. Um, and uh, Kenny is also depicted in this work um, in the middle by Nan Golden um, in the public in, in Boston Garden. Um, and, um, and then on the right, um, we see a photograph by Shelburne Thurber in which Kenny appears in the middle. Um, at this point, he was no longer performing in drag as, as Ivy, um, but he was um, making, um, he, he was a very talented stylist and um, designer and made all of the outfits that you see um, the, the, in that photograph on the right, as well as the one in the middle, I guess, but it's a little bit different. He used to dress up Janet Stein on the left, as well as Nan Golden on the right, and then Shelburne Thurber herself in um, very, um, you know, catching outfits and um, you can also just see how aesthetics are, are shifting um, in in that period. And um, you know, I don't think by any means it's evocative of what we saw at the other side in the early '70s <laughs> um, from a few slides ago. Alan Frame is another photographer whose work we've already seen because he photographed Nan Golden. Um, this is a, a really beautiful work that he made um, of his uh, roommates, uh, of his boyfriend's roommate, Kevin, in drag. Um, and, you know, interested in how photography becomes a narrative tool of self-making and world-making, we actually see on the side table an image of the same individual in drag. And in the exhibition itself, you'll see that there are these two photographs side by side. Jason Byron Gavon is another photographer who it's been a pleasure to work with. Uh, I love this image because it depicts um, people, you know, um, who um, are the showgirls at, or just community members at a bar called Together or Togethers, which was on Boylston Street. It was the home of the Sugar Shack um, in, uh, before 1976. Um, when the Sugar Shack closed and Togethers took over the space, a lot of the queens um, who'd been at um, the other side uh, after that place closed because of gentrification essentially um, migrated to um, Togethers on Boylston Street. And here's a larger selection of these photographs. Uh, on the left, it might be difficult to see the final image. You see Sylvia Sidney outside of drag, as well as one of Jason's um, most important muses named Colette Abate. Um, 
And um, I'm also uh, interested in exploring how um, punk really transformed uh, queer culture in, in Boston in particular. And um, there's no one's work who better speaks to that shift than uh, Gil Thacker, who um, also studied at the museum school and, and MIT and um, uh, was someone whose photographic practice involved elements of filmmaking and performance and, and fashion. Um, she was best friends with Mark Morris Rowe, who we see here. And um, their nightclub of choice was called Spit or Spits, and it was on um, Lansdowne Street, so um, not too far away from here in the Fenway, which is where a lot of punk venues and were at the time, and uh, I'm uh, thrilled that I'm able to showcase all of um, these images that were taken the same night, um, the, the ones that you see in the center. So two by Gail, uh, one by Phil and Flash, who is a famed uh, punk nightlife photographer in Boston, of this performance that took place called um, the fashion show in which everyone's wearing body paint. And then um, the two images um, at the end in the middle um, are showing you know, the, the aftermath of this evening in which we see Linnell and Gail in bed together and uh, Jack Salafia washing body paint off. So um, again, I am eager to cross hatch these histories with a consideration of um, what was going on in the gay press and um, thinking about, you know, so many histories of the gay press in Boston, I think focus on the transformational capacities of writing. And of course that is important, but I'm interested in images and photographs in particular and their particular powers um, for picturing uh, what, what queerness and community and intimacy and, and politics might look like. And uh, I don't have a, the time to, um, to go into uh, you know, a full history of gay liberation in Boston. Um, but as I said, it was really a center of, of organizing and um, a really, really exciting place to be gay and to be political. And this took a lot of different um, forms, um, you know, in terms of, of, you know, whether you were involved as an organizer or an artist or a writer, um, as, as someone who went out, um, there were a lot of different ways in which people participated and found community. These are some early publications by the Student Homophile League of Boston and um, Lavender Vision. So again, these, this is 1970 Stonewall, um, happened in 1969, and it really um, fueled uh, gay liberation on a national scale as well as more globally. Uh, gay community news uh, arose in, um, at the, um, well, it didn't arise here, but uh, its its earliest headquarters was at um, the Charles Street Meeting House. And this was um, a place that was very friendly to different social movements um, because Reverend Randy Gibson um, was, was very um, welcoming and um, it was also a place where a lot of important civil rights activism happened. It was a place that hosted uh, gay dances, which you see on the left, as well as um, publications such as Gay Community News originally, though soon it would relocate to Bromfield Street, which is um, close to Park Street Station. And um, th these are undated, but um, you know, just give a sense of how um, cool, you know, people were trying to, um, you know, be or uh, the, the ways in which gay liberation was trying to appeal to a particular um, aesthetic in in this period. Um, it had its own aesthetic languages that were different from the ones that were being pioneered at the museum school and so forth. Um, but uh, you know, arising from similar 
contacts or similar communities and stomping grounds. And then on the right, we have this uh, terrific image of um, gay community news in Paris, which really shows this transnational circulation. Um, at the time, this was, as I said, the most influential and widely disseminated paper in um, the United States. And the body politic in Toronto was also, also had a very um, big influence in circulation. Um, but you know, but those two were, were really key in terms of um, determining what, what gay liberation looked like. Looked like. Uh, and I think uh, th uh, the GCN office, the Gay Community News office, was a social and a sexual space. It wasn't uh, too far away from a lot of bars or the, the Pilgrim Theater for that matter, but it was um, a lot of people talk about it as a cruising environment. Um, and um, a place that brought people together across lines of gender and sexuality and race and class. Fag Greg uh, is another key publication we've talked about. Boston Gay Review um, is similar to Fag Greg and had a lot of connections with the Good Gay Poets Collective and uh, press that arose in Boston. A lot of people were working across these different publication venues. And uh, what's interesting about Fag Rag and, gay community, uh, and um, gay community news, I guess, but also Boston Gay Review is that it was a site in which people were thinking about photography and its discourses and practices. Um, so trying to theorize what it meant for a photographic practice to be gay um, does it need to involve, you know, pictures of S and M, or um, is there, you know, something um, that could be queer about an image that was less yoked to a particular identity or subjectivity? These are issues that were being puzzled out in uh, this article, for example, by Sal Farinella, uh, that featured some work by Hap Paul, who is an early um, artist making work about s and in, in the Boston context. Bad Attitude was um, a lesbian sex magazine um, that arose originally as an insert in Fagrag, which is a connection I love um, because Fagrag was very much geared toward gay men. Um, but again, all of these people were friends and knew each other, and the offices were all located on Bromfield Street. And so um, in this exhibition, I pay close attention to the, the, visual, the visuality of these publications. And um, again, artists and photographers um, such as Sherry Edwards and Susan Fleischman um, played an important role in fostering a visual identity for these particular um, publications. And later on, uh, though I don't uh, have the, I didn't decide to show them in this exhibition, um, there's the transgender tapestry, which um, um, was an early venue for thinking about um, trans issues um, and trans identity, but mainly through the vantage point of um, cross-dressing originally, arising in the early 80s. Um, and um, it was less visual in terms of the, the particular project that it was conveying and became increasingly um, you know, aligned with what we think of as the trans politics later on in the 1990s. But again, uh, originating from a Boston, uh, not specifically Boston context, but um, in the greater Boston area. I think it was published originally in Lincoln, Massachusetts, which is interesting. And it mostly involved people who lived very straight lives in the outside world, like straight cis lives, um, but would congregate together at different occasions um, in which they were able to uh, cross-dress or um, have so a very different sort of identity and subject position than, for example, the people appearing in Nan Golden's photographs. Um, so again, nightlife photography was 
an important part of GCN, and Joe Russo's work um, is a case in point of that. Um, and these are some um, images that are um, printed in GCN and included in its various archives uh, of a benefit at Club Max, which is, I think, the former Playboy, um, man uh, Playboy Mansion, the Playboy Club in Boston. Um, the Saints was a beloved lesbian bar run by a collective of um, multi a multiracial collective of lesbians, um, and it was located in the financial district um, in the 1970s, but unfortunately the, the collective didn't own the space itself. And so I um, believe there was a conflict with the, the, the person who owned the building. During the day, it was very much a place where bankers um, would go, but at night it turned into this, you know, a lesbian dance party, um, and one of the first places to do that. Um, and but unfortunately, the relationship with this manager owner soured, and so um, the bar um, it disappeared. Um, it was terminated in 1980, 1979 or 1980, and GCN um, created a profile that. Um, was an oral history of, of this particular bar featuring these women. And then on the right, we see you know, an image uh, repeated three times, um, really capturing the sense of fading um, and the, the vanishing that takes place with so much of the ephemerality of, of queer nightlife in a whole host of contexts. The work of Sherry Edwards is especially um, important to me. Uh, in part because she was the art teacher at um, the middle school I went to, but um, she uh, was the art editor at Gay Community News and has a fascinating story because she um, um, was really involved in a whole range of uh, social movements from anti-war activism to feminism to gay liberation to... Um, later on AIDS activism, um, and, uh, uh, but also the punk scene. And she had a xerography studio uh, that was on Thayer Street, which is now where SOA is, if you're familiar with that area. And uh, it was, that was where all the punk um, artists and musicians were living. Uh, and uh, it was a xerography studio in which there was actually a gallery and um, people were able to learn how to make this experimental work, which she called uh, electrographs or elect electrograph electrography, <laughs> um, which is uh, what you see on the right here. These are not great images, my apologies. But essentially, she, um, I love it because it was, um, you know, this was a moment in which you didn't need to, um, you didn't need to um, rely on outsourcing for other people to print your material or to print your material in a dark room because of the advent of Polaroids and um, uh, being able to take your own films increasingly. Um, and so she's actually videographed, video recorded her lover and herself having sex. Um, and then it became multiple lovers in the late 70s um, and uh, was able to turn through a very complex process I don't fully understand, turn this image into a positive and a negative, which she then retooled um, through a document camera um, and uh, experimented with its printing through, his, um, through a 1970s Xerox machine. And the final uh, result was is these brilliantly colored images that are totally abstract, which actually portray uh, lesbians having sex with each other. Um, but for Sherry Edwards, it was very much a response to the so-called sex wars of the early 1980s. Um, you might remember that there was this really fierce debate that was taking place between the pro-sex feminists and the anti-sex lesbians um, in terms of pornography and the, the ways in which um, you know, Sh Sherry wanted to 
uh, develop an anti-oppressive or a non-oppressive mode of, of making images um, of, of lesbian sexuality. And the aesthetic language that um, she engineered, I think, is quite genius. And it circulated kind of widely, even though this is a history that people don't um, know very well. This is how they appear in the exhibition. You can also see her impact on um, how the aesthetic of gay communities shifted in particular. Um, and um, she was there in the early 80s, so this, this is um, a really fabulous example of that. It was when um, Diane, Diane Feinstein, um, uh, I, I think, elected not to support um, um, not gay marriage, but some sort of partnership law in San Francisco in 1982. And so, um, you know, the headline or the, the cover story is Feinstein pulls a fast one. Um, and it's as if, you know, the Xerogra the, the, the image is yanked from, um, the Xerox machine before it has time to, um, actually capture it in its fullness. So that sense of motion is just so brilliant and so aligned with um, the particular uh, expertise and aesthetic of uh, Sherry Edwards across her other projects. Uh, Craig Bailey, who is here today, uh, is another photographer who, whose work uh, really enriches our understanding of these histories. Um, he was active a little bit later in, in the 90, beginning in uh, around 1990 um, as a photographer who worked for the press um, in, in various capacities, for example, for South End News. Um, but some of his um, work from, uh, that were publicity images for um, the theater offensive, which is the LGBTQ um, theater organization founded in 1989 in Boston. This is something that I um, am really delighted to showcase in this exhibition. So again, thinking about theater as a form of nightlife too, and not just the Pilgrim Theater or the State Theater, but other forms of um, theatrical and artistic production. On the right, we also see um, some uh, images that were, uh, that Craig took for a safer sex guide called Color Me Healthy, which was uh, geared toward uh, men of color in Boston. I think it was the first um, focus campaign um, or safer sex guide that, that was specifically trying to reach um, men of color in New England. It was a partnership with Craig Hickman, who was at, um, who was the leader or the one of the program managers at Fenway Community Health, spearheading this program. Um, and Craig Hickman is actually in the middle of this image, which is a publicity photo for Gil Burton and Diane Beckett's Muses, one of these productions run by the Theater Offensive and um, at uh, the Boston Center for the Arts in 1997. Uh, it's the first, it, it was um, marketed as Boston's first uh, fully produced black lesbian play. The final part of this exhibition and in, in my general research into it is about um, community archives and the ways in which photography has been so essential to not just the documentation of our histories, but for uh, our survival. Um, and um, one archive of vernacular images that I'm interested in is by Nick DeWolf, and I already described briefly Charles Street Meeting House as um, a key institution within this larger environment. It was located in Beacon Hill, um, but uh, yeah, uh, Nick DeWolf wasn't actually um, queer himself. He was an engineer who went to MIT and lived in Beacon Hill, um, and an amateur photographer who was just so enthusiastic about capturing um, everything around him, <laughs> uh, including um, the life of this building, the Charles Street Meeting House, and it's just this um, extraordinary documentation of the first 
uh, gay public gay dance party. Uh, right, so this is 1970, right after Stonewall. That's outside of a bar setting. So this is very important um, as a sort of political project, and it shows, um, you know, a different type of uh, club kid, if you will. I mean, we see some hippies and some activists. It's not exactly the the cool um, kids who are partying at uh, Spitz or Togethers or the other side, but uh, still a really important part of these histories. And then finally, um, or not finally, but another archive that I am enamored with is uh, Jim McGrath's Playland Archive. It um, show, it was, this was a bar that was in the combat zone from the 1930s to the 1990s, and um, Jim McGrath worked there at first waiting tables and then as a bartender um, for, I think, 38 years. And he captured um, various aspects of the bars, um, you know, every day um, during this period. A lot of these images were taken of him by other people. Um, you can see him, um, for example, in the image on the left, he's at the far left, the top row, he's the person um, on the right there. Um, but again, it was a place where um, there was just a lot of transgression and um, where people of different backgrounds, different classes and races and genders and sexualities were coming together. Um, and uh, McGrath purportedly was really essential to its aesthetic identity for the holidays and um, for you know, back then, gay bars really transformed themselves as far as, um, you know, every holiday had a, a different, um, you know, very strong commitment, whether it was the 4th of July or Halloween or St. Patrick's Day or Valentine's Day or Christmas. Um, and uh, one thing that I love about the oral history interview that Jim McGrath gave for the History Project in 1997 was that uh, it it was um, these festivities were occasions when everyone came together as one big happy family. And I think that that idea of family, um, which you know actually is quite contemporary in terms of notions of chosen family within queer discourse today, um, it is really powerful. It's a term that comes up a lot across the different practitioners who I've had the chance to work with. Um, Jason Byron Gavon, for example, talks about how Togethers was a place of, of street family. It was where all the street kids came together and, and found family with each other. Playland was another bar that, um, it was a bar that Christian Walker adored. And, and um, this is a photo that he took. It's the only known photograph of an interior in the combat zone that wasn't the Pilgrim or State Theaters. And then finally, um, I want to conclude with the work of Patricia A. Gazemba. Uh, Pat, as more people refer to her, is uh, a professor at uh, Salem State College. She's taught women's studies and English literature there since the 1960s and um, was one of the founders of the History Project in 1980, which was when a lot of uh, archivists and community members and scholars and writers came together because there was an urgent need to, um, to bring together um, some sort of repository of papers and uh, publications and, and um, images of, of LGBTQ life, um, not just in Boston, but um, in New England at large. So this was um, and remains a community archive, meaning that it wasn't attached to a university. And uh, sh there was a bar that she'd been doing research on uh, going back, and it, it had history going back to the 1950s called, uh, originally it was called The Lighthouse, then it became uh, a bar called Fran's Place. It was located in Lynn, Massachusetts, so on the North Shore, and attracted a very... Um, working class uh, lesbian clientele, which um, was one sort of community constituent that wasn't well represented within this nascent queer archive in, at the History Project. Here are some more images of it. And um, so 
these pictures that she took, she was actually um, dating at the time or partners with um, a photographer, um, oh gosh, Craig, what's her name? Marilyn Humphreys, um, who's a very well-known documentary photographer um, in this area as well and has been involved in the history project for um, quite some time. And so uh, I, th this, this exhibition is trying to bring together these histories in new ways and um, in art history or curatorial practice, these types of photographic projects aren't um, often thought about in relation to each other, but I think that there's a lot of, uh, a lot to gain by thinking about, um, you know, the coextensiveness of these different uh, pursuits um, and the ways in which different idioms of photography uh, influence each other and spill over into one another. Um, I'm trying to, you know, tell more histories to generate new narratives and uh, familiarize ourselves with a greater number of images um, that might enrich our understanding of, um, you know, what queerness and community might look like. So thank you. Um, I would love your questions and, and thoughts. <laughs> I have a mic. If anybody would like to ask a question, I will come to you with a microphone if you want to raise your hand. Um, thank you. That was really a, a, an amazing overview and um, a lot of great details and good images. Um, you alluded to the fact that there was um, com a kind of commute between Boston and New York. Can you talk a little bit mm. more about how these figures kind of came in and out and what they found in Boston that they might not have found in New York or vice versa? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's something that I've been grappling with a lot in part because of, excuse me, this designation of the Boston School, even though almost all the people who are represented in that so-called school. So I'm thinking of Nan Golden, Mark Morris Rowe, David Armstrong and um, Jack Pearson and Taboo, those and Shelburne Thurber a little bit. Those are the people who are canonized within this history, and all of them except for Shelburne moved to New York um, in I'd say the late seventies or early eighties. Uh, there definitely was a lot of cross pollination between Boston and New York, um, and you can imagine why, and not just for art students, but also for political activists and you know photographers who are operating in the gay press and so forth. Um, but I think that one of my commitments is to foreground practitioners who've actually been really rooted here in the community and um, whose work didn't become part of that emerging sort of canon, if you will, um, and who've you know stuck around and, and, and been you know continuing to work over the years. Uh, so I personally am really in favor of you know foregrounding that those types of stories and, and images. And I think one of the beautiful aspects of this particular lecture series is that we're able to um, do that you know in a way that is really. Um, you know, honoring all of these different layers of histories and the different people who've contributed to um, Boston as we know it now. Um, how do you think the media uh, can move forward to accurately represent queer photography and art? Mm, that's a big question. <laughs> I think that I am interested in these histories in the gay press in particular in part because, um, you know, I, maybe it, it should be self-evident, but it might not be. Um, you know, queer people and issues and stories weren't represented in the mainstream media um, at all in the 1970s, except in very negative ways <laughs> for the most part. And that's was really exacerbated by the AIDS crisis and all the homophobia um, of that period as well as, you know, going into the 90s. Um, and so the fact that 
you know, we're, even though, you know, trans people in particular, you know, policed and um, discriminated against um, denied basic rights across the country today and beyond, of course, um, in general, there's a lot of queer LGBTQ representation in the media. Um, and I think it's easy to forget that, you know, we needed a gay press um, back in the 1970s because you know there there wasn't any other venue in which these stories were deemed legitimate in which LGBTQ people could become visible through images and texts and so forth. Um, so as far as the future, um, you know, I, I, I think that it's important to continue to pay attention to people on the margins and to think more capaciously about, um, you know, where we're getting our news to, to uh, value sites of discourse and practice that are at the margins and continue to be at the margins, even if the New York Times is covering, you know, you know, LGBTQ life, for example. Um, I have uh, an article coming out in the in Times and in, in T Magazine um, very soon, and it's about gay bathhouses and how artists are um, representing them today. This is something that would not have, you know, been in the mainstream press 30 years ago or even five years ago. Yeah, thank you for your talk. I enjoyed it greatly. Brought back a lot of memories. Uh, you opened your, uh, your talk by speaking about uh, photographers who captured the marginalized elements of society. But, you know, I remember those days back in the, in the 70s and such, and there were a lot of, let's call them mainstream uh, gay clubs um, in the Back Bay and on Beacon Hill, for example. And the ones that you're focusing on here, you know, whether it's the other side or, or Playland, they were the marginalized of the marginalized. Okay, and especially if you're talking about uh, men who would move back and forth from the clubs into the theaters, which was an economic choice, let's put it that mm -hmm. way. Um, so I, I'm wondering why there seems to be an absence of photography you know, taking place in the, in the more mainline gay community. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and I appreciate uh, those distinctions that you're making, uh, because clearly my interests gravitate toward the more marginalized uh, sites within this larger cultural landscape. I would say that people were photographing them, those, those more mainstream places. Um, for example, the History Project has a lot of material related to Buddies and 1270 and um, the Ramrod Room or Herbie's Ramrod, um, a lot of places that were a little bit more like focal within a more mainstream gay community in, in the 70s and 80s, um, though it still feels it's hard for me to call those sorts of sites mainstream still <laughs> because Napoleon. Napoleon, so yes, that's a little bit, that has a deeper history. But I haven't actually seen images of Napoleons. Um, I don't know where that visual archive is. Uh, and that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, that would be, I would love to know if anyone photographed it or if there's you know other sorts of visual documentation of it. I have time for one more question here. Hi, your talk was incredible. Um, how would you describe the ways in which queer photography has changed from the 70s and 80s until present day? That's another enormous <laughs> question. Um, but I think that um, I think that a lot of photographers are uh, energized by these these histories of art and photography and visual culture. Uh, and I see a really strong sort of aesthetic uh, impulse that, that values the historical in a lot of contemporary practices today. Um, did you say something about moving forward or like what? I, I don't, maybe I misheard that. Um, I, I think that the, the smartest 
um, most interesting photographers are doing things that are um, in dialogue with a historical record. And that's something I feel strongly as an art historian. <laughs> um, but I, you can really tell when someone's making an image and putting tremendous thought into it. Uh, and when someone's not doing that, I think that queer people and trans people really need to understand the richness of uh, art history in order to think about what the future looks like as far as representation and questions of subjectivity and identity and community. Thank you so much. Thank you.